Thank you for joining the call. This webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ria Guy, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call today, October 5th, 2022. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidential, confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2022 slash october.html. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. One, identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Two, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Three, identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Four, identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. Or five, list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide, please. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there's no bias. The presentations will not include any discussions of unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide, please. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is zohu webcast, all one word. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete an evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 7th, 2022. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2022 slash october.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 8, 2024. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, One Health Office Deputy Director, is going to share some news and updates. Over to you, Colin. Thanks, Ria. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for October Zohu call. Before our presentation begins, I'd like to share some updates. You can find links to these resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. And if you aren't yet subscribed to the newsletter, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage to sign up. 
CDC's monkeypox website details where we know or details what we know about monkeypox and animals and includes information to help prevent virus spread from people to pets and other animals. You can continue to find the latest COVID-19 guidance and resources for keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy on the CDC website. Next slide, please. Today's newsletter highlights recent publications, including one titled GPS Tracking of Free Roaming Cats on SARS-CoV-2 Infected Mink Farms in Utah, and another titled Outbreak of Acute Gastroenteritis Among Rafters and Backpackers in the Backcountry of Grand Canyon National Park, April, June, 2022. Next slide, please. We've also shared links to announcements such as the recent CDC health advisory, uh, variant influenza virus infections, recommendations for identification, treatment, and prevention for summer and fall 2022, and a web resource on water, sanitation, and hygiene or WASH related emergencies and outbreaks. Next slide. Additional web resources include the National Environmental Assessment Reporting System and a video on adding antimicrobial resistance in COVID-19 wastewater surveillance. Next slide, please. Some events and observances of interest include Global Handwashing Day, which is coming up on October 15th. On October 25th, there will be an AMR exchange webinar addressing health inequities by strengthening antibiotic stewardship. And on October 30th through November 3rd, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene as annual meeting will be taking place. Next slide, please. Finally, there are several ongoing outbreak investigations, including a new E. coli outbreak linked to ground beef. Next slide, please. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. We'd appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from the human, animal, plant, and environmental health sectors, and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education this call offers. Our next Zohu Call will take place on November 2nd, please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. That's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L at cdc.gov. And now I'll turn the call back over to Ria. Thank you, Colin. Next slide. You may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide and on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and on today's email newsletter. Next slide, please. Our first pre presentation, Harmful Algal Bloom Event and Illness Surveillance in the United States, the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System 2020 is going to be presented by Marissa Vigar. Marissa, please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Ria, um, and thanks everyone for joining this afternoon. You may recall a presentation on OHABs during a Zohu call last year, which was focused on 2016 through 2018 data. We've since re implemented an annual summary process to release data in a more routine manner. And today I'll provide an overview of data in our 2020 report. Next. Algal blooms are a naturally occurring part of ecosystems. They're supported by many factors, including warm, stagnant, stagnant water, nutrients, and occur in marine, brackish, and fresh bodies of water. However, some of these blooms can become harmful to people and animals through either the toxins they produce or their impact on the environment. Next. These are referred to as harmful algal blooms, and I'll call these HABs throughout the rest of this presentation. So when I give my elevator speech and mention that I work on HABs, I frequently follow up with other explanatory phrases depending on who I'm speaking with. Next. You may have heard stories of blue-green algae closing a lake beach after a dog illness or been on a beach vacation during a red tide and seen dead sea life along the shore 
or even heard a news story about someone becoming ill with paralytic shellfish poisoning. Not all halves are the same. The term encompasses blooms by both cyanobacteria and microalgae. Blooms caused by cyanobacteria, which are commonly known as blue-green algae, mostly occur in fresh water. And the photo on the bottom left shows a severe cyanobacterial bloom in Florida during 2016. Red tides, as shown on the photo on the right, occur in marine or brackish water and are often caused by marine dinoflagellates, such as Karenia brevis. Next. Halves can result in negative economic and environmental impacts, but this presentation will focus on halves which can make people and animals sick. Most often this is through exposure to toxins in some form, including skin contact with water containing toxins while swimming or doing other activities, breathing in water droplets containing toxins, or ingesting toxins through drinking water, fish or shellfish, which have bioaccumulated these toxins, or even dietary supplements which contain algae and have become contaminated. Next. Symptoms can really vary greatly and depend on things such as how a person or animal was exposed, how, lo how long they were exposed, the type and concentration of toxin present. Um, and of course, this is not an exhaustive list of factors. There could be other risk factors such as related to the person who's exposed. And we're really still learning about that. Treatment for these illnesses is primarily through supportive care to alleviate symptoms. And this really highlights the importance of preventative measures. Next. So OHAV, the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System, launched in 2016 to collect data about HABs and HAB-associated illnesses using a One Health approach. Next. OHAVs is nationally available to state and territorial public health agencies who can also designate user accounts to their environmental or animal health counterparts, such as the State Department of Environmental Quality. Next. Reporting is voluntary, and this is both in general adoption of the system and for its separate components. So for example, one state might only report half events and another might also report human or animal cases of illness. Next. It allows for systematic data collection about HAB events and cases, OHAB's users can report any HAB event, regardless of whether or not there are associated cases in humans or animals. Within the context of OHABs, the term HAB event describes the identification of a bloom or the detection of HAB toxins in water or food. Human illnesses are reported individually, and animal illnesses can be reported as single cases or in groups, such as a flock of birds. The reporting system links this HAB event data with illness data. Next. OHABs is not, however, representative of all HABs or illnesses, both because not all states have adopted the system and as a general limitation of surveillance data in general. Next. OHABs does not replace routine water monitoring systems, real-time investigation tools, or event response systems. Next. HABs really are a great example of One Health at Work. Um, it requires cross-disciplinary collaboration between human health, animal health, and environmental agencies. And the graphic shown here is part of a reporting flow infographic available on our website, which demonstrates the various partners involved in reporting these HABs and associated illnesses to OHABs. You may ask why CDC is collecting data about animal illnesses related to HABs. And of course, in addition to the fact that we all love our animals and they contribute to our overall well emotional well-being, Due to a variety of factors, including physiological characteristics and behaviors, they're often more frequently or more severely exposed to HABs. Monitoring animal illnesses can help provide an early indicator of a HAB or its severity, detect potential threats to human health, and ultimately better protect the health of humans, animals, and the environment. Next. All right, so now we can move into a summary of the 2020 OHABs data. Next. 13 states reported to OHABs for 2020, and this includes both coastal and inland states. The majority of all reports were related to HABs in freshwater. I should also note that as of last week, 26 states have reported into the system, um, and it's really exciting to see this adoption grow. Next. 
The 13 states reported a total of 227 hands that resulted in 95 human illnesses and at least 1,170 animal illnesses. A HAB event in September killed at least 1,000 carp. As mentioned, HAB HABs without cases can be reported as shown on the left. 124 events did not include any case reports. So of the 29 events with human illnesses, nearly half of these, 45%, involved two or more cases. And I wanted to note that these would be considered HAB-related outbreaks and reportable to the National Outbreak Reporting System, or NORS. Next. OHABs allows for events to be classified as suspected or confirmed, and for cases to be classified as suspected, probable, or confirmed. These classifications are based on various epidemiologic, clinical, and environmental criteria. HAB events are often classified as confirmed, 79% in 2020. On the other hand, 64% of human cases were classified as suspected, and 97% of animal cases were classified as probable. Availability of and access to clinical testing continues to be a limiting factor in confirming these cases. A few realistic examples of some barriers to clinical testing include that for animals, the cost usually ends up as a responsibility of the animal owner who may not be willing or able to do so. Toxin degradation makes appropriate storage of the specimens and timely testing critical in detection. And finally, with so many possible toxins and congeners of toxins at play, there's not a single test which can detect all HAB toxins as opposed to with other etiologies. So in other words, a negative result does not necessarily mean there's no toxin present. Next. As previous OHAB data has also shown, water quality monitoring efforts are a major contributor to the detection and reporting of HAB events that are reported to the system. Um, reports directly from the public are also a significant factor. Next. The first human death associated with algal toxins was reported to OHABs in 2020 and was a result of paralytic shellfish poisoning. This is caused by saxitoxin, a toxin produced by a marine dinoflagellate. However, paralytic shellfish poisoning has been well recognized for over 200 years. It's one type of several documented causes of death related to algal toxins, and all of these are primarily through ingestion of contaminated fish or shellfish. Illness onset was quick, a median of 3.75 hours, and poison control center collaborations continue to be a driver in how these human cases are identified. And this is demonstrated by the healthcare seeking behavior with nearly three quarters calling into poison control centers. Interestingly, nearly a quarter of human cases reported in 2020 were associated with national parks. 21 of 22 of these were attributed to a single HAP event. Next. This chart shows classifications of signs and symptoms reported in 2020. Data across years continue to show gastrointestinal, generalized, and dermatologic symptoms are frequently experienced. More specifically, rash and nausea were the two most reported symptoms for 2020, but you can see here there's a really wide spectrum of illness characterization. Next. There were 37 domestic pets, and 1,133 wildlife cases of illness in 2020. All 37 reported pets were dogs. 21 groups of animals were reported, and these ranged in size from two to 1,000 individuals. When looking at group wildlife reports, fish were the most reported wildlife, and this accounted for 90% of all cases. For individual wildlife illnesses, marine mammals were most reported, these accounted for more than half of all wildlife illnesses, if you exclude that large carp die-off I mentioned of at least 1,000 individuals. For the 19 dogs with a one-time exposure, illness onset ranged from one minute to three days. Veterinary care or treatment was provided to 89 of these animals and included 66 marine mammals, 19 dogs, and four birds. Next. Animal sign data for 2020 was only available for 37 individuals, and these were all dogs. As you might expect, this information is really limited for wildlife, especially in the case of mortality events. 
You can see here that while the range of signs are similar for dogs, as in human cases, neurologic and cardiopulmonary classifications are much more frequent. And this is likely a reflection of the ingestion of cyanobacterial toxins in algal mat or water by dogs. Next. OHAPS continues to prioritize the adoption of the system as well as data accessibility. The recent implementation of routine annual summaries was a step in this direction. The system also underwent some pretty big user interface and functionality improvements at the end of 2021. We still have goals related to data integration and overall modernization of the system, um, but we have received some really positive feedback on these changes from our users. Over the summer, structured interviews collected user feedback for improvement, and this is going to inform future decisions regarding OHABs. And finally, OHABs data has helped to inform some health communication materials developed by our fantastic health promotion team. Next. You can view OHAB's data summaries on our website, cdc.gov slash HAB. The 2020 summary should be going live anytime now. And some of these OHAB's related messages are also posted by various CDC social media handles. Um, these messages are available for use on our website as well. Next. Lastly, you can find out additional communication and outreach resources on our website including graphics, one-pagers, clinical resources, and Spanish versions of our communication tools. Next. Um, that's it for me, and when it is time, I'll be happy to receive any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge of this unique One Health issue and providing a really nice reminder that One Health is not only about zoonotic diseases. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, The Science Behind Human-Animal Bonds, is by Monique Udell. Monique, please begin when you're ready. Thank you for having me here today. Next slide, please. So at the Human-Animal Interaction Lab at Oregon State University, one of our missions is to improve human and animal relationships and well-being through evidence-based understanding and practices. Next slide. And from a health perspective, this is important for a number of reasons, um, some of which include the fact that training that supports better understanding of animal behavior and also can help improve relationships is also known to help reduce risks. So for example, the risk of dog bites or injury or potential illness transmission. Also, we are increasingly seeing that the physical and behavioral health of animals within a family system can also impact general family health. And also, some forms of human-animal interaction appear to provide benefits to both the animals involved and also the humans. And on the human side of things, there's been increased interest in whether human-animal interactions can be used to improve mental health, increase activity, social development, and even recovery from illness or disease. Next slide. One of the things that we're also seeing is that there's this increased trend of including animals within our households. So if we just look at dogs and cats, we see that now there are over 60 million households that include dogs and over 47, house, 47 million households that include cats. And these numbers appear to be steadily increasing. Next slide. So one of our goals is to ask, are these relationships beneficial in terms of human welfare, in terms of animal welfare? And if so, what are the predictors that suggest that certain types of relationships may have these beneficial impacts and have the least amount of risk possible? Um, because we're seeing increasingly not only that these relationships are forming, but also we're seeing these varying results in terms of research looking at the benefits and risks of engaging with animals. So we really have to dig deeper and ask questions about what are the factors that are contributing to these different outcomes. Next slide. So one trend is that we are considerably um, more likely now than we were even a few years ago to look at the animals living in our homes as parts of our family, and in some cases, even as our children. And we're also seeing that animals within our households, including dogs and cats, are increasingly forming bonds towards human caretakers that approximate 
the infant caregiver bond. Um, and so this is really critical. This kind of relationship has a lot of implications, not only for the type of relationship we share, but also the potential impact of these relationship on health. Next slide. So from a basic ethological framework, attachment is simply an affectional tie between two individuals that promotes preferential proximity seeking, so closeness, and especially when we're talking about infant caregiver attachment bonds, the function of this from an evolutionary perspective is for animals um, or humans that require care or provisioning after birth to be able to seek out the resources that a caregiver could potentially provide. This might include food, protection, security, and we're seeing that dogs and cats in households and maybe other species as well are forming these type of attachment relationships to their primary human caregiver. Next slide. However, it's also important to note that just because a bond exists, it doesn't necessarily tell us about the quality of that relationship. So attachment relationships vary in quality and kind. So you can have a bond to another individual, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean all bonds are created equal in terms of the benefits. And this is especially true when talking about things like stress resilience and stress reduction in the presence of an attachment figure. Next slide. So some of the things that we look at when we're evaluating an attachment between companion animals in a household and their primary human giver include separation distress, and this is whether or not the animal seems to recognize when the person leaves a space, and so this might be following to the door, making vocalizations. This is not the same as separation anxiety, which is a diagnosable clinical condition. Um, most animals that have a bond to a human or another animal show some degree of separation distress upon the departure of that individual. Next slide. We also look for greeting and reunion behavior. So does the animal notice when the person returns and how do they respond? What's the quality of that greeting? Next slide. And then in secure relationships, and these are the ones that we're looking at in terms of sort of promoting the highest level of stress reduction and the highest quality of bond, we're also looking for something called contact exploration balance. So for example, um, next, you'll see an arrow pop up that indicates that this dog um, in a sort of an unfamiliar location where there's lots going on is able to use the human as a source of security from a distance. So while they might go back and visit the human, um, they're also able to explore that environment and get that security just from their person being nearby. Next. And this is contrasted with individuals who may be bonded to their owner, um, who though may not be able to as effectively use their owner as a secure base or a so source of stress reduction in unfamiliar or novel situations. Next slide. So in the laboratory, we can evaluate this by putting animals through a strange situation where essentially they find themselves in a novel environment at first with their human caretaker, their bonded individual. Then they find themselves alone in that space for two minutes. And then we evaluate attachment style based on how the dog or cat responds to their owner's return. And in secure attachment, again, the one that seems to be most associated with stress resilience and the most welfare benefit, we typically see that while there is separation distress in the owner's absence, that the animal is quick to engage in greeting behavior upon their owner's return, they're comforted and show signs of decreased stress, and they go back to engaging in contact exploration balance where they can engage in relaxed activity, play, but they engage in periodic check-ins with the owner. Next slide. In insecure ambivalent attachment, we tend to see a similar separation distress upon the owner's departure. We also see a greeting and reunion behavior. However, in the case of ambivalent attachment, we typically see prolonged um, proximity seeking, and we don't see that same stress reduction. So typically we're going to see that these dogs take longer to recover or cats take longer to recover, even in the presence of their owner, and they may maintain that close proximity for the whole trial duration. Next slide. We also sometimes see what's called insecure avoidant attachment. Typically, this is only representative of about 10% of the population, but these are animals who sometimes do not show much response to their owner's departure or return. 
um, or at the very least seem to try to self-soothe or deal with their stress independently, often staying at a distance from their owner upon return. And these are animals often that do have a bond with their owner. They're also often pretty relaxed in that initial baseline phase. So it's really only after a stressful event where we see the differentiation between animals in this category versus the other categories. Next slide. So in our lab, we've done this with a variety of different populations and what we're seeing across dogs, kittens, cats, and even comparing it back to humans is that there's relatively similar proportions of insecure to secure attachment towards a primary attachment figure within a household. So children, typically this is with their parent, um, and then dogs, kittens, and cats, we're looking at this often with the primary adult caregiver in the household. And we're seeing that we're finding these proportions are, are pretty similar across the board. Next slide. And so this is important because when we look at the human literature, in human children, attachment styles predict a lot of long-term outcomes, including quality of future relationships, um, mental health associations with depression, anxiety, even aggression, impulsivity, um, problem solving and ex executive function, and even motivation. Next slide. And our research looking at the health implications of these attachment relationships between animals and humans in the household actually are predicting very similar things. So we're seeing that it's having implications for the well being of these cats and dogs and can affect things like quality of future relationships in these animals, also social competence, problem solving and motivation and persistence, just like we see in humans. Next slide. We're also seeing implications for therapeutic settings. So for example, when we look at trained therapy dogs and we assess their attachment style towards their primary handler, we find that pretty much all the therapy dogs that we've tested are able to complete their typical um, trained activities. So being close to a therapeutic participant. However, securely attached dogs spend most of their time focused on that therapeutic participant and they're able to sort of orient both towards their handler and their therapeutic participant appropriately. However, when we look at dogs with an insecure attachment to their handler, we see a differential trend towards where they're gazing. So they're spending more of their time gazing back towards their handler and less of their time gazing towards that therapeutic participant. And this can be really impactful in a therapy setting. Therapy participants often feel that if the dog is looking away from them, that the dog doesn't like them. And that can have an impact on therapeutic outcomes. Next slide. We're also finding that these attachment relationships are important in animal assisted interventions. So some of the interventions we run focus on children with and without developmental disabilities. And we're finding that we can build and strengthen the relationships between these children and their dogs, leading to mutually beneficial outcomes, including increased physical activity and improved social developmental skills. However, we're also finding that prior attachment relationships between dogs and parents in the household are predictive of how easily these dogs will form secure attachment relationships to the children. So all of this information is really important, not only to understanding whether or not these dogs are gonna be well suited for, as therapeutic participants, but also what we can do to increase their performance and also increase the well-being of both the dog and human involved. Next slide. In home settings, attachment also matters. Um, so we see that the quality of attachment in general tends to lead to better and human animal outcomes. So when we're assessing whether having an animal in your household is beneficial, quality of attachment seems to be an important predictor of that factor. Also, um, we're finding that attachment can provide a social buffer and also social lubricant. So walking a dog or even walking a cat can sometimes allow people to interact with others in ways that they might not otherwise do. Um, and that might be because of the safety and security that the animal provides, but also because the animals tend to attract the attention of other humans. We've also found that a bonded pet can provide purpose and promote caretaking and responsibility. And this seems to be especially important for children and in elderly populations. And it can also provide motivation for healthier choices like increased physical activity. Next slide. 
So the good news is um, we know sort of the roadmap to developing secure attachment relationships between people and animals, which includes early socialization, increased contact and affection, also this awareness and responsiveness to the body language and needs of the animals that we live with, and calm responses to actions. We also know to avoid things like isolation, ignoring things like hunger or discomfort signals in animals, and also making sure that we're avoiding things like aversive control or over controlling types of responses towards animals. Next slide. So from the health perspective, what, what can we do? Um, and one of the things that we can do is just become better informed and also help educate others. We know that education goes a long way in improving these outcomes and really identifying and acknowledging that the quality of human animal interactions matter. So when we're discussing whether it's beneficial to have animals involved in a therapeutic activity or in a home, it's not enough just to have the animal's presence. We have to talk about the quality of that relationship. Um, and also to recognize that people will often do things with and for their pets that they may not otherwise do for themselves. For example, increasing physical activity or engaging in a better diet or be better healthy behavior. And so considering human pet partnerships is one strategy that can sometimes help, help improve the health and welfare of both the animal and the human involved. Next slide. So thank you all for your time and hopefully I'll have an opportunity to answer any questions you may have later. And that's all for me, thanks. Thank you so much, Monique. It was super interesting to learn more about how our pets attach, which I think so many of us have or continue to experience so personally. Next slide, please. Our final presentation for today um, will be by Dr. Brandy Darby, and it's titled Christo Cryptosporidium Parvum Outbreak Associated with Raccoons at a Virginia Wildlife Facility. Dr. Darby, please begin when you're ready. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Brandy Darby. I work as a veterinary epidemiologist with the Virginia Department of Health. Um, while I'm the one doing the presentation today, I also wanted to acknowledge my uh, co-authors on this outbreak investigation listed on this slide, without whom this work would not have been possible. Next slide. So I wanted to start off uh, just laying the foundation with some information about Cryptosporidium. This is a protozoal parasite that causes diarrheal illness in people and animals. While several species of Cryptosporidium exist, human infections are most commonly caused by C. hominis, which primarily infects people, or C. parvum, which infects both people and animals. Infection occurs after ingestion of infectious oocysts and can be transmitted person to person, animal to animal, animal to person, or through ingestion of contaminated food or water. Next slide. Illness is characterized by watery diarrhea and abdominal cramping. The incubation period in people is between seven to 10 days, and that becomes important later in the presentation. Illness typically lasts for seven to 14 days, though shedding of infectious oocysts can continue after symptoms resolve. And the other important point I'll make at the beginning here is that Diagnosis of cryptosporidiosis is made by examination of stool samples, but tests for cryptosporidium are not routinely done in most laboratories. Providers need to specifically request testing for this parasite. Next slide. Between 2009 to 2017, cryptosporidiosis was the third leading cause of diarrhea associated with animal contact in the United States. Domestic ruminants, particularly cattle, um, including pre-weaned calves, goats, and sheep are the animals most commonly associated with C. parvum infection in people. Next slide. On June 19, 2019, a wildlife rehabilitation facility notified their local health department of a gastrointestinal illness outbreak affecting 10 of 24 or 42% of their full-time staff and interns. Symptoms included vomiting and diarrhea with an illness onset date beginning on June 8th. 
the local health department recommended norovirus testing and general infection and control measures. The following day, the wildlife facility notified the health department that one person had tested positive for cryptosporidium antigen at a clinical laboratory. Next slide. The wildlife facility provides care for many native animal species. At the time of outbreak notification, the facility reported that six juvenile raccoons had diarrhea, but other animal species were healthy. Routine fecal flotation of raccoon samples for ova and parasites were negative. However, this test would not detect the presence of cryptosporidium. Next slide. Our goals for the outbreak investigation were to confirm the etiologic agent, determine the source of the outbreak, identify risk factors, and prevent further transmission. We conducted a retrospective cohort study to assess illness and exposures, and distributed a questionnaire to all 49 facility personnel to capture their demographic information, any illness that they might have experienced, healthcare seeking behaviors, uh, the types and nature of contact that they had with various animal species, food and water exposures, their use of personal protective equipment, and adherence to recommended cleaning protocols. In addition, a facility site visit was conducted to observe opportunities for exposure and animal care practices. Next slide. A standardized case definition was developed for this outbreak investigation. A probable case was defined as gastrointestinal illness occurring after June 6, 2019, and a person who worked or volunteered at the facility and experienced diarrhea and at least one of the following um, abdominal cramping, vomiting, anorexia, or diarrhea lasting 72 hours or more. Confirmed case met probable case criteria and had additional laboratory evidence of cryptosporidium infection. Next slide. The laboratory aspects of this investigation were very much a collaborative effort. On the human side, four stool specimens were tested for norovirus and cryptosporidium at the Division of Consolidated Laboratory Services, which is Virginia's state public health lab. Additionally, clinical testing was performed on two specimens, one of which we mentioned was a positive for cryptosporidial antigen, and the other was um, tested via ova and parasite testing, which again would not detect cryptosporidium. On the animal side, six raccoon fecal samples were tested at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Animal Health Laboratories using an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. This test was validated for use in bovine species and was used off-label for this part of the investigation. One raccoon needed to be euthanized for reasons unrelated to this outbreak, and a small intestinal tissue sample was collected and tested for cryptosporidium as well. Next slide. All of the samples that were tested through our state public health and animal health laboratories were forwarded to CDC's CryptoNet lab for confirmatory testing. Next slide. On the environmental aspects of our investigation, uh, the facility was served by private well water. And so the Virginia Department of Health's Office of Drinking Water visited the facility and collected well water samples from three pretreatment taps both inside and outside of the building. And these were tested for bacterial indicators of fecal contamination. Next slide. Okay, let's go through our investigation findings. We had 43 of 49 facility personnel respond to our questionnaire. Six were full-time employees, 16 were interns, and 21 were volunteers. 36 were female and seven were male with a median age of 20, 25. 15 people, or 35%, met confirmed or probable case definition. Next slide. So this table shows a selection of animal and environmental exposures that our questionnaire asked about. And if you um, just hit next, you can see that exposure to um, 
next. There we go. Exposure to cottontails, foxes, raccoons, and drinking of well water were shared by a majority of ill respondents and were significantly associated with illness. Next slide. Um, significant exposures were further examined using a multivariable regression model. However, fox and raccoon exposures were not independent. Both are rabies vector species, so people need to be pre-exposure vaccinated for rabies before they can work with these animals. Seeing as the raccoons were experiencing diarrhea and the foxes were apparently healthy, the raccoons were chosen for inclusion in the model. And as you can see, contact with raccoons and drinking facility water remains significant. Next slide. The uh, results of the well water sampling are shown on this slide. And so you can see that low levels of total coliforms were detected and one sample had a single E. coli detection. The VDH Office of Drinking Water advised that the water was an unlikely source of cryptosporidium in this outbreak, and so no additional testing of water was conducted. Additional evidence pointing away from water as being the exposure source is that uh, the first raccoon became clinically ill only two days after arrival at the facility, while we don't know the incubation period of Cryptosporidium parvum in raccoons, the incubation period in other animal species is about seven days, which hints at exposure of the raccoons prior to arrival at the facility. Next slide. So this slide shows the epidemic curve for probable and confirmed human cases associated with this outbreak, with probable cases shown in lighter blue and uh, confirmed cases in darker blue. Key dates, including date of first illness onset and local health department notification are noted. Next slide. Here we've overlaid raccoon cases to the human epi curve with all cases plotted by illness onset date. You can see that the first raccoon became ill on May 28th, followed five days later by its cage mate, and eight days later by a third raccoon in another cage. Human illnesses followed. And you can see that the first raccoon became ill two days after arriving at the facility. Next slide. To summarize our laboratory findings, four people had positive laboratory testing for cryptosporidium, both the initial positive antigen test and three positive PCR tests. Seven raccoon specimens, including the small intestinal tissue sample, were positive for cryptosporidium. And molecular genotyping at CDC revealed that two human specimens and all seven raccoon specimens shared the same cryptosporidium subtype. Next slide. Okay, so to kind of wrap up and put things into context, we know that raccoons can be infected with several types of cryptosporidium, including cryptosporidium parvum. And um, while these infections are known to occur, they've not been previously reported in association with human illness. So, and also while outbreaks of cryptosporidiosis have been reported in association with animal contact, this is the first time that wild animals have been identified as a source of exposure in an outbreak. Next slide. While no outbreak investigation is perfect, we have good evidence pointing to raccoons as the likely exposure source. First, raccoon illness preceded human illness by 11 days. Second, molecular typing identified the same subtype of C. parvum in both ill raccoons and people. Third, the first raccoon became ill only two days after arriving at the facility, making exposure of the raccoons at the facility less likely. And lastly, of the four significant exposures shared by a majority of ill people, contact with raccoons had the highest attack rate and risk ratio and was significantly associated with illness in multivariable modeling. Next slide. Our two main investigation limitations are that while the foxes and the cottontails were you know, apparently healthy, they were not specifically tested for cryptosporidium as part of the outbreak investigation. 
And similarly, while the tap water was tested for total coliforms and E. coli, um, the water source was also not specifically tested for cryptosporidium. Next slide. So this is the first report of human illness after exposure to raccoons infected with C. parvum. Raccoons and other wildlife species capable of infection with C. parvum might be an underrecognized source of human infection. Routine testing of wildlife for cryptosporidium is not always performed for a, a number of, of good reasons. Um, though we think this outbreak provides good evidence that human healthcare providers should consider C. parvum as a differential diagnosis in persons who've had contact with raccoons and then present with gastrointestinal illness. The other important note um, is that this is the first time that this specific molecular subtype has been reported in raccoons. Next slide. I just wanted to wrap up by again thanking all of my co-authors and the persons listed on this slide who uh, aided with our investigation outbreak. And I have one more slide where I left some references where people can find additional information. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Brandy. Um, that was a really fantastic example of a One Health epidemiologic investigation. Um, we'd like to take one more opportunity to thank all of today's speakers for their really informative presentations. Next slide, please. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2022 slash october.html. It does look like we have time for a few questions today. Um, so please go ahead and use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions for any of the presenters that you've listened to today. Please make sure to include the presenter's name or topic so that we can help identify who those are going to. Looks like we've got a few questions here already. The first is for Marissa. Marissa, um, someone asked, are there any endangered wildlife species most at risk for HABs? Yes, so that is not something that CDC specifically is looking into, um, but I did want to note that there's a pretty large um, federal agency involvement um, related to HABs, and I'd, I'd recommend, um, you know, if you're interested in learning more to reach out to one of them. I know specifically USGS um, is an agency pretty involved in wildlife and HABs, so they'd be great contacts. Thank you, Marissa. Um, it looks like we have one more question for you as well. Concerning OHABs reporting, is Florida a participating state? Florida has numerous HAB events throughout the state, and as a HAB researcher, I feel this would be extremely beneficial. If Florida is not participating, how would we go about participating in reporting events to OHABs? Thanks for that question. Um, yes, Florida has uh, reported into OHABs, um, but there are a lot of factors that um, dictate when, when and what a state is reporting. Um, I would recommend reaching out directly to Florida Department of Health um, to learn a little bit more about their participation. And um, thanks for the question. Thank you so much, Marissa. Um, we've also got a couple questions for Monique. Um, the first question is, um, the person asks about data on households with pets. Does the data account for households that have both cats and dogs or households with two or more animals from multiple species, not just dogs and cats? Yeah, thanks for that question. So that data is based on a report that is issued by the American Pet Products Association. And the, the numbers that I mentioned were specifically looking at any households reported to include a dog or a cat. They might also include other animals or multiple dogs and cats. However, on that same slide, there was also a breakdown of the number of dogs and cats living in households. And it turns out people are more likely to have multiple cats or a larger number of cats than dogs. So actually one of the interesting factors there is that cats as individuals are now outnumbering dogs in households. So those are good questions. And there's lots of different ways to look at that data. Um, and you can find information about numbers for a variety of species, but those are just the ones I highlighted. 
Thank you so much, Monique. It looks like we may have a couple more questions for you. Um, one is, it has become increasingly common for public health agencies to recommend that people diagnosed with potentially zoonotic diseases isolate themselves, not only from other people, but also from their pets, um, as was the case with COVID and now monkeypox. This approach is based on a low risk tolerance for human to animal disease transmission. And the question asker is curious, what research has been done to quantify the potential costs of this approach? Examples, compounding distress due to social isolation by preventing access to a so source of emotional support or harm done to animals by separation, anxiety, neglect, unsafe bathing methods, et cetera. That is an excellent question. And I know that especially the COVID-19 pandemic really drove an increase in research into those sorts of questions. And just also in general, how changes in day-to-day -day life with animals have impacted both human and animal welfare. So for example, um, how does it impact the animals and the people when they're spending much more time with their pets at home? And then what happens when they return back to the workplace? Um, I don't think we have all those answers yet, although I would expect to see a lot more research coming out on that because sometimes the publications fall a little bit behind when the research is being done. But I think, again, it's going to depend a lot on, on the quality of those relationships and sort of the role that those relationships might play in the lives of those individuals. Um, and certainly one question is how, how much are people following those recommendations, especially if they are closely bonded to their pets? And if they view their pet as a source of support, like you're saying, or they view that pet as their child, um, that might have a lot more um, weight in terms of the potential negative impacts of separation, whereas other relationships might not have as much impact. Um, and I think it'll be especially important to look at certain populations. So for example, there's evidence that um, children especially tend to have very strong bonds with the pets in their household and certain populations of children even report having stronger attachment to the pets in their household than even any of the humans in their household. So what are the implications then if that child is um, separated from the pet? So I think those are excellent questions, but I don't know that we have all the answers just yet. Thank you so much, Monique. Um, I'll turn to Brandy now for a few questions. Um, one question for you, Brandy, is what additional biosecurity practices were put in place at the Wildlife Center after this outbreak occurred? And were there lessons learned at that center? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, the facility really did have good um, biosecurity protocols in place to begin with. I think one of the things that we learned going through the outbreak investigation is that the products that they were using for disinfection were not effective against cryptosporidium. And so once we were able to understand what was going on, we were able to make recommendations for changes to some of those disinfection products. And so they began using a hydrogen peroxide based cleaner um, during the outbreak. And I believe they continue to kind of intersperse that into their um, cleaning protocols to this time. Thank you. Um, one more question for you. Um, in areas with high levels of cryptosporidium in surface water from springs, rivers, private wells, such as areas in Iowa, is there a reason why there would be low levels of clinical cases reported from infection? Do people just not go to hospitals when they have symptoms? Or is it just something doctors don't consider? Um, well, I mean, I would say that if cryptosporidium is in the environment, there's a chance that people are going to become exposed to that. Um, if, if you're seeing high levels in the surface water, but a low number of cases, it could be due to a number of factors. Um, you know, we like to say that dilution is the solution to pollution. So even though, you know, we might see it in the water, perhaps the, the movement of the water or the volume of water that's present is enough to dilute that out so that um, people aren't taking in an infective dose. Um, it, it could also be due to, you know, the ways that people use that water. Perhaps they're not using it as a recreational water facility and so are preventing coming into exposure with contaminated water in that way. Thank you so much, Brandy. 
Um, it looks like we still have a few questions, but unfortunately we are out of time for today. Um, if you do have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. So please feel free to reach out to the presenters directly. And as I mentioned earlier, a video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide, please. Please join us for the next Zohu call, which is occurring on November 2nd. Thank you all for your participation today. And this ends today's webinar. Goodbye, everyone.